From the Centre for Public Christianity, you're listening to Life and Faith. I'm Simon Smart. And I'm Justine Toe. In the name of ALS and charitable giving, I am ready for the ice now. I do not think it's presidential uh, for me to be splashed with ice water, so I'm simply going to write you a check. Oh! <laughs> We're not just casually holding all these $100 bills. We're actually going to put our money where our, where our mouths are, and every single person you see here, we're going to donate on their behalf $100 each to the cause. Three, two, one! You might remember from a few years back the Ice Bucket Challenge. Everyone from Oprah to President George W. Bush to Taylor Swift filmed themselves getting buckets of ice and water dumped over their heads, and then they nominated three more people to do the same. And it was all for a good cause to raise awareness of ALS, also known as motor neuron disease in Australia, and Lou Gehrig's disease in the US, and to encourage donations to medical research. In the US alone, donations to the ALS Association more than doubled during the Ice Bucket Challenge period in July to August 2014, compared to the previous year. Granted, it was a wildly successful campaign, but in some ways the Ice Bucket Challenge is probably better known for the celebrities that took part in it rather than the cause. So when I read up on motor neuron disease, or MND, I was pretty overwhelmed by how devastating it is. People with it gradually lose the use of their limbs, their ability to speak, swallow and breathe. The average life expectancy from the onset of the disease is two and a half years, and there's no known cure or effective treatment. In Australia, more than 2,000 people have the disease. Every day, two people are diagnosed with it, and two people die from it. In 2013, just before Christmas, Phil Camden was one of the Australians who received that diagnosis. It was probably 12 months before I actually went to get the diagnosis. I felt that I was slowing down in my running and my swimming and and certainly going upstairs. So I went to a chiropractor who uh, thought it was a pinched nerve. So I had all the x-rays for the spine and they thought, yeah, we can work on this and get it going okay. Um, So probably seven months into that, they said, look, you probably need to go to a physio and get your core muscles looked at. And so I spent three months with a physio. And uh, eventually he he said, look, you're not getting any stronger. You know, you should be a lot stronger. You're disciplined in the exercises. Everything seems to be, you know, you're doing all the right things and nothing's changing. So he got me up on a table and my legs began to shake uncontrollably. You know, he said, can you stop the shaking? I said, no. So he said, well, you need to get to your GP. And uh, the GP had seen this 15 years ago as a, Uh, a doctor working in a hospital and it took him back 15 years and he'd seen the fasciculation in another patient and so he sent me to a neurologist straight away and uh, by the 12th of January I was in with a neurologist and uh, they'd given me all the tests and second and third opinions after that. What do you do with that? I mean, you think it's a pinched nerve and then months down the track, it's actually, you're, you're suddenly at a neurologist's um, clinic. And then what's it like to get that diagnosis? Yeah, well, it's strange because for the first little while, you're thinking, um, well, you know, at least we found out what it is, we can work on it. But then they tell you, you know, there's no known cause or cure. And, you, you know, you'd probably be dead within 27 months. Um, that was a real shock, you know. It was like you get in the car, drive home from that, and you're thinking, why hasn't the world stopped? You know, like, mm-hmm. doesn't everybody know what just happened, you know? So it's a it's a fairly dark place to be at. Mm. Phil, tell, tell us a bit more about that, because you, were you in pain in, in the way you were operating? Your legs were sore, or were you just finding you are getting weaker? No, um, actually, I was getting massive cramps. So, again, I put it down to, hey, I'm not stretching enough while I'm running and swimming. And, and so I was getting abdominal cramps, uh, cramps in my calf muscles. Like, this is every night while I was sleeping, I'd wake up with cramp muscles. That's where the pain was. Uh, they say motor neuron disease is not a painful disease, but it is. It, it, the pain, you don't feel the motor neurons dying. So, in that case, it's not a painful disease. But the lack of muscle supporting the skeleton 
creates its pain as well. And the muscle deteriorating, cramping. And Phil, it's not just the disease that's affecting you, is it? Yeah, well, obviously, um, you know, you lose your job, you lose, you know, your purpose for getting up every day and the, the purpose for being the vision that you had. So a lot of things... Yeah, a lot of people just talk about the disease, but it's the ramifications of a terminal illness that you've got to deal with. You know, the death of a job, the death of hope, the death of vision, the death of direction, the death of a salary coming in every week, uh, the possibility of losing your home. So there's a whole lot of things that suddenly start cascading in on you as well as trying to go, um, okay, I've got to deal with this disease and the progression of it. Mm. Um so I think anyone out there with a terminal illness um, would, uh, would probably understand the, the total ramification of the diagnosis more than just that on the body but on the soul and the spirit and on, on the circumstances of life. What was it like to face these losses yourself? I mean, you mentioned it was a pretty dark time. It really was, you know, and I think not just for me, uh, because of what, what I was thinking about myself, but what I could see what I was doing to my wife. You know, I I took the blame for what she was feeling. You know, it was like, well, if I wasn't terminal, you wouldn't be so sad. You wouldn't be, you know, and then for what I was doing to my kids and putting them through. So you've got to deal with all that and sometimes you blame yourself. So um, it, it was dark for her. She, As I said, you know, she she was uh, crying every day and, and not knowing you know, where to go to from here. In terms of um, questioning, you know, well, how, how come this is happening to us when we had so much that we thought more to do and, um, and losing a lot of what we were doing in the process. So she would come to me and say, I can't just, I can't read the Bible anymore, you know, and, and us, you know, being Christians, I guess that was the, 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 the source of our strength. And when you say, I can't read it anymore without crying, um, then you had to call on the reserves of what's been deposited over many years, I guess. Phil, you would have been in a position over the years as a pastor of a church of mm. uh, caring for people in great need. Um, did, you, did you have that sense that lots of people have where this sort of thing happens to other people and not to me? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I was hardly sick at all, you know. I mean, I can remember being in hospital because, you know, I fell off a bike and broke my scapula, but, but nothing of any serious illness in my life up until that point. And so I'd been with people who were dying. I, you know, obviously sat with people who were dying and had um, the challenges of cancer and different diseases. Uh, but I was relatively fit and healthy and well, you know. And, uh, and so when it happens to you, it, you, you, do, you do call on those things that I, I guess you helped other people. So you do hear yourself talking back to yourself, you know, what did I say to people in this situation? And certainly that has helped me, you know, the, the self-talk quickly became more about um, what I would have said to others in my situation. And it helped, did it? Some of your, your words came back to you in a way that was helpful? They didn't ring hollow? No, they didn't. In fact, I had, a, I had help. I mean, I, I went to a professional psychologist and psychiatrist and, and, uh, and sought help as well because I thought, well, I would be encouraging people who were in this situation to come and get help from me. So I need to then put myself in that place. So I, I really did um, want to do this in a, in a healthy way. Mm. I read on your blog that you travelled to Europe to undergo some treatment that wasn't yet available in Australia. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, it's a, it's still not available in Australia, although, and it's um, more of a trial drug. They use it for um, MS patients in France, and so I travelled to Bordeaux. And I thought, oh well, I can't lose by going <laughs> there, can I? Even if I get a good bottle of red or something like that. But uh, worth the trip. Yeah, that's right. So I went there, looked at. Um, spoke to the scientists there, spoke to the professors that were dealing with this um, trial and uh, and had some blood tests and certain things. And so they made up a script for me. They send that to Milan. They get that made up there. And then I, I am able to legally bring three months personal supply into the country uh, myself. And so I've been on that since uh, I, I went to France a couple of years ago. 
So it's worked out well. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's hard. People say, well, is it working? I'm going, well, I don't know. Unless I go off it and I'm not willing to really yeah. go off it, um, you don't really know what it's doing. But it, it's it's one of those things where hope, I think, if, if you're going to live with hope in, in your life, hope has to have something tangible to do. You know, you have to fill your life with a goal or a vision or some sense of I'm doing something to create a, a, a hope. And But on top of that, I take 40 vitamins a day. I'm on, I'm on a lot of um, things to keep my body healthy. And if there's this one area that is not healthy, at least if I keep everything else healthy, I think I'm giving myself a fighting chance. Mm. Mm. You're listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. And we're speaking with Phil Camden, a church pastor who was diagnosed with motor neuron disease in 2013. But he's not letting this diagnosis stop him from living with hope and purpose. He's been known to say things like, I may have MND, but MND does not have me. And what was meant to imprison me has empowered me. And he means it. In fact... When Phil received the letter from the doctor saying he had MND and only two years to live, he decided to call this letter a visa into an unknown world. Yeah, that's pretty hard for other people to understand, but I would go into the Congo, the DRC, every every year. I have some great friends in the Congo, and we were setting up a business integrity and governance um, you know, company, I guess, to to help students in universities come out and, and live and and deal with things in their own world. And, and so I would have to get a visa to go into the Congo every year. Someone would invite me and then I'd get a temporary visa to go in. So when I got the letter from my GP to say that I had motor neuron disease to present to, you know, my workplace, cause I had to, you know, say that, you know, I only had two years to live and to superannuation, all of those things. As I placed the letter down, I felt that you know, um, I, I guess all I could put it down to was this inner voice, you know, and some would put that down to God speaking to me. But but it was really impressed on my spirit that this letter was my visa into an unknown world. And I knew nothing about motor neuron disease, a world of darkness and hopelessness and fear where I was to take hope and light and, and freedom into that. And, uh, and it's certainly been that. I, I now am visiting many with motor neuron disease. And tell us about that experience. You've met, you've met people and you've had some pretty, pretty profound moments with people in that who are going through the same experience, right? Yeah. It is daunting at first, you know, because once you are diagnosed with motor neuron disease, there's an association that gets in contact with you to support you and you know it's run by volunteers or or support from other people and so you go to this group and we were parked outside I remember the first day we went where we parked outside in our car and we're watching people in wheelchairs and unable to walk or you'd walk into the room you go shake someone's hand and they couldn't shake your hand because they'd lost all the muscles in their arms and hands or you'd say hello and they couldn't talk back because they'd lost the ability to talk or to swallow and and so you'd see people uh, at a place where you knew you were going to be sooner or later in the progression of the disease but we found people who you know were were courageously you know trying to live the last moments of their life to the best of their ability and um, and became great friends with them. And through that, they invite us into their homes. Am I remembering this rightly, that you took the funeral for some of some of these people? Yeah, I've uh, three, three at the moment who have uh, be- become great friends of mine. And, and you know, one gentleman uh, was diagnosed one year after me. Uh, he was a big, burly guy, you know, Kawasaki Magazine spoke of him as the typical Aussie, you know, guy, uh, He big tats, muscles, you know, I thought we could harvest some of those when he first walked in, be careful, you know, we, we could do with some <laughs> of your muscle. Uh, but he deteriorated very quickly um, and he asked me during our relationship and our friendship if I would take his funeral and, and so I took, I took that funeral and... And uh, I've taken another friends and and, uh, and also one gentleman who was probably 
we didn't know he was two weeks off dying. You know, we're in his lounge room and his living room. And because I'm a minister, I guess they're very open in terms of talking to me and opening up their life and allowing me to pray for them. So I was able to pray for him. My wife was there and we prayed for him. And two weeks later, I'm standing over his grave in Gilgandra, you know, speaking at his funeral to all his relatives and loved ones, you know. So it, it has been... Um, a very emotional but rewarding as well time. Mm. It's interesting because um, the the day after I did the funeral for the guy who was Kawasaki's hero, you know, uh, I was doing the funeral and the next day, so the funeral was on the Thursday, the next day I got a phone call and it's from a 30-something-year-old, you know, young man. He rang me and said, hey, Phil, uh, I was wondering if you could come around and visit me, you know. I said, yeah, sure. He said, look, I've just been diagnosed with motor neuron disease, had two little toddlers, two little boys, and his wife was there, and I drove around to meet them. And I said, mate, how did you get my number? Like, how, how did you find me? And uh, he said, well, I was crying out the backyard. My neighbour saw me crying. He came over, asked what was wrong. I told him I had motor neuron disease. I'm going to die within two years, leave my little boys behind and my wife. And... And then his his neighbour said, hey, I know someone who can help. And that was another lady. So he rang the lady and the lady said, look, I can't help, but I know a guy that can. And she had my mobile number. And so I just went around with them, simply prayed with them. You know, he was really in a dark place. He showed him, you know, that, you know, we can fight every day. We can fight for another day and, and, and live for another day and, and talk about living in the reality of now, you know, and making every moment with his kids count. And uh, we've created a great bond, a great friendship, you know, and he's talked about, hey, I'm on the journey, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not there yet, but I'm on a journey of faith and belief. Uh, and so we're having these discussions and I guess encouragement means putting courage in and that's what our relationship's all about now. What about for you, Phil, living day to day with this hanging over you? I mean, mm. it, it's your life, you know, does it cast a shadow over even just small things? Yeah, I, th I think for me, uh, there is such a thing as a shadow of death, you know, obviously for me and what I believe uh, as a Christian, you know, the power and the sting of death has been eliminated. There's no fear in dying, uh, yet you still got that shadow. There's this thing that never leaves you. It's always there. The, the, you're always thinking, okay, this is the best day that I'm going to have because tomorrow I'm going to be weaker and the next day I'm going to be weaker. The good thing about that is every day that I have is going to be the best day <laughs> from this point on because it only gets worse, you know what I mean? And um, and so there is that darkness. You, you feel another cramp, you feel another a muscle spasm where you haven't felt it before and you think, oh, no, this is the beginning of that muscle deteriorating. Um, you bite your tongue, it so many times you're thinking my tongue's getting lazy, it can't move quick enough, so I'm going to soon lose the ability to talk or to swallow. Um, so all of those things, you're kind of, you're thinking, wow, how's this going to be? And obviously, then you've got OTs and physios coming in. They're wanting to put, you know, help in your home. In other words, rails here in the bathroom, in the shower. They want to put a ramp. They want to bring a wheelchair in. All of those things start intruding on the normality of your life and you can't get away from it. Yeah. It obviously affects your family in all sorts of ways. Yeah. Sure, there's the railing coming into the bathroom, but even more than that, that, that shadow that you talked about hangs over them as well too, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, everything that they... Uh, decide to do their idea is well where will dad be in two years time what what will life be like in six months time should we plan a holiday will he be able to fly will he not be able to so a lot of decisions are made based on me which which you know I, I found very uncomfortable because the focus was on what would dad be able to do and so on and so forth but you, you have to come to that reality and, and the reality is um, motor neuron disease is here unless a supernatural intervention happens you know. You said there was no fear in death what do you mean by that? I'm, I'm not scared of of death itself I, I'm 
you know, I want to be totally honest with you. The process of death freaks me out, you know. I think I don't know what I'm going to be like when I can't roll over in bed, can't scratch my nose, can't shower myself or toilet myself or feed myself or, you know, turn my – you know, all of those things you become so dependent on other people. And I'm not looking forward to that. But actual death itself, for me, has lost its sting. It's lost its power over my life because I I truly believe in heaven and eternity. And so for death, for me, is just, you know, entering into another realm of existence and life, which is far better than I think what we could ever experience here. Phil, you spoke about hope earlier and it needing to be practical. Mm. You know, what does hope mean to you, especially because you are looking forward to what you say is eternity? Yeah. Well, I think that is. I think uh, the basis of my hope is heaven and eternity. And so, you know, the world, nothing that happens to me in this world can rob me of that hope. And yet hope that gets you out of bed every day must be about the tangible things that you are able to do. Um in moving yourself forward, you know, Um, and so it's like, well, you know, if I don't have a job, I, you know, hope gets you out of bed and going for another interview. It's going and lining up again, filling out another resume or sending another CV somewhere. So, you know, people can create a, a hope environment around them by putting something in front of them that they can do. And I think that's where we have to take control of it. I I was the one diagnosed with motor neuron disease. Nobody, you know, it it wasn't the responsibility of anybody else but me. I was the only one that could truly um, do something about it for myself. Um, And I've seen what this disease can do when there is no hope. It can accelerate through your body at amazing speed um, because when there's no hope, there's stress, there's fear. And stress and fear accelerates these things in our life. It's an inflammation to our cells and our neurons. And, um, and so, you know, for me, ho- hope is, you know, um, I guess saying things can be better. No matter how bad they are today, things can be better tomorrow. And even in the areas of finding a cure. Now, they may not find a cure in my lifetime, but if I can be instrumental in helping find a cure for someone who is going to have motor neuron disease when I'm gone and they're sitting opposite a neurologist and that neurologist says, you have motor neuron disease, but don't worry, there's something we can do. And if that's based on the fact that so many died of motor neuron disease previously, which motivated scientists to find a cure, and then so be it. From the Centre for Public Christianity, you've been listening to Life and Faith with Simon Smart and Justine Toe. That was Phil Camden, a Christian pastor living with motor neuron disease. If you want to read more about his journey, he blogs at fridayswithphil.com. There's some really powerful insights there into pain, purpose and hope. And if you want to hear more stories like this, please visit our website, publicchristianity.org. Or subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Just type Life and Faith in the search box to find us. And don't forget to leave us a rating or review while you're there. Every review helps other people discover our show. Next week, a boy who went from reading communist propaganda for Mongolian state radio to running the first Christian radio station in his country. You won't want to miss that. We'll see you then.